name is Anne. Uh, oh, this is loud. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my name is Anne, and uh, welcome to my talk about uh, mobile library development. Mm. That's better. Yeah, so I've been uh, I've been a mobile developer for a very long time uh, since like Android was it in its infancy, um, and recently, well, half a year ago, I switched to doing libraries full time. Um, yeah, I'm Slovenia originally, live in London, and uh, work at a company called Pusher. We are a developer tools company. Um, we have we're building essentially APIs to solve developers' problems and. Uh, make hard stuff easier for, for you guys building awesome apps. Um, one of the cool things that we're building is the chat API. If you're mobile developers, iOS specifically, we're launching this very soon, so it's gonna be like a chat API if you're interested in something like that. Okay, but I'm not here to talk about Pusher today, I'm here to talk about libraries and uh, library development in particular. So um, we're gonna start with uh, a very brief introduction to libraries and uh, what they are, how they, how they work, what's, what's, what's specific uh, regarding libraries in comparison to apps, and then we'll follow um, a few basic, like follow the library development lifecycle from the conception and design to all the way through the development release and uh, maintenance in a nice waterfall fashion, essentially. So, I love libraries, and uh, I think everyone should, um, as a user and as a developer as well. Uh, they save me time, uh, because I don't have to write stuff twice in two different places, or even three or four, if I can deduplicate a lot of stuff and put it into libraries. Um, putting stuff on GitHub is always a good practice, like um, employers love that, love that and uh, and uh, it's just nice to give something back to the community. And uh, yeah, I mean, some of us do it for the, as, a, as a day job, which is also good fun. Okay, so about libraries, what they are. They're essentially a bunch of classes, a bunch of methods that encapsulate some shared functionality. Um, if that functionality is not shared, they don't have a purpose. Uh, and what they're not, they're not apps. Um, in the sense that apps are used by the end users, so people using the phone, uh, interacting with the apps, um, and uh, therefore they're a lot smaller in scope usually. Um, but that doesn't mean that like there, there's any less libraries there or than apps out there because you have libraries that. Uh, that essentially uh, are included in a bunch of apps like uh, uh, Alamo Fire on iOS is, is a classic example or, um, or Retrofit on Android is just like that stuff that's everywhere and also an app usually consists or includes a bunch of libraries. So you got this many to many power ratio. Okay, in general. Uh, or in brief, so we got a bunch of stuff we call libraries and they're not all the same. Uh, you might have heard terms like frameworks, SDKs, libraries, so it, it usually means um, how big they are, how, w what kind of scope they operate in. So libraries tend to be smaller, frameworks tend to kind of um, control your app a bit more. So for instance, if you pull in like an MVC framework that will kind of uh, direct your whole architecture, like for Android, you have Mosby or something similar. And SDKs come with external tooling as well to, to allow us to do stuff. Um, yeah, uh, they can live in many different shapes and forms. So they can live on mobile only, on server, or on both. They can live beside uh, um, apps as a, as a testing utilities. Um, most of the stuff that you're familiar with is probably accessible for free on GitHub or, or uh, CocoaPods uh, means that it's open source, but by far not everything. Like I used to work in an enterprise, we had a bunch of uh, private libraries, we had a bunch of uh, non-open source, stuff that doesn't make sense to, to share with others who aren't part of the organization. 
And yeah, um, and some of them are, are here to make money. So like, um, if if you're selling a commercial product that has a has a um, has some APIs, you might uh, you might want to uh, develop an SDK for it. So that's uh, that's how you kind of package it as a library as well. But most importantly, they are products. So uh, the user is the developer, which is great because we all speak programming um, or code, but uh, we have to take into account that like similar to how developers, I mean, we, we come from so many different countries, we speak so many different native languages and, uh, and we have varied levels of experience. Um, Uncle Bob once said that developer population doubles every five years. So if you're if you're been doing it for five years, you've been doing it for more than half of the people. So uh, yeah, there is a great variety. So we still have to think about what's the what's the easiest possible way to use our stuff, uh, to to interact with our stuff, and uh, <coughs> think about accessibility a lot. There is also one more, one additional fact about developers. So we don't like to do too many things, and we like to automate things. And uh, yeah, because we're lazy, we we don't like to repeat ourselves. And uh, an objective of things like libs uh, should be that they should enable that. If 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 something is not going to save me time or money or effort, then I'm not going to use it. Simple as that. Okay, that was all about, uh, in general, about libraries. I'm gonna um, move on to more practical things. So let's start with the API. Uh, the API is our user interface. So apps have UIs, libraries have APIs. Um, simple as that. But it's not just one little thing, it's, it's, it's actually a lot of different things. So we have to think about how, how, how people will, will um, enter our, our library, how, how, where do they start? And uh, then we need to think about what kind of data is going to be passed around, what kind of, um, how are we going to, how are we going to, um, how are the methods going to be uh, called and all that. And obviously we have to think about what happens when uh, things don't go as planned and uh, we, we have some crashes. So we have to think about handling that as well. Um, entry points. Uh, Again, there's there's a great variety of things we can we can talk about here. For for instance, um, like there they, there may be some things that you have to instantiate, like constructors and things like that. But essentially, what I'm talking here about here is the stuff that kind of sets things up for you to to start using it. So you have to think about what do I need? Do I need an API key? Do I need uh, do I need uh, to specify uh, <coughs> Any, any any initial values um, are any of those values optional should they be optional how do I how do I configure that so all of that I call entry points in UI you also have this uh, you, you, you can talk about uh, widgets so on Android you just you can put like an you can create some UI element via uh, in the code or in the XML view so um, so you have different options here too. But yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, how to, how we usually construct things when there are like classes in code. So um, iOS has it nicely with Swift because uh, it's, it's a nice little language. It's got, uh, it's got, <coughs> you can create your constructors uh, uh, with uh, parameters that are optional or have default values. Um, you can create them with uh, with names as well, so named parameters, which allow you to kind of specify how your API is going to look like or how, how it's going to be created really simply. In Java, because it's it's a bit of an older beast, you don't have this, so you may want to consider doing some other, uh, taking some other approach to 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 creation. So constructors is a really good. Uh, uh, sorry, builders is a builder is a very good pattern to use here. Uh, Square use it in, in their open source stuff as well a lot. 
but obviously now the Kotlin is becoming a thing, or it's already a thing. We'll see about that in a few days in, in with Google I/O. But uh, Kotlin has a bunch of the same stuff as Swift, so optionals, name parameters, really cool stuff. Um, yeah, key here is essentially what uh, we have to ask ourselves: what do we need? What do we need to provide? Like. What is it that our library cannot really function without? So what, what kind of input is the minimum, minimum viable input, uh, to say that? Oh, and uh, what are the things that we want to <coughs> uh, add? So yeah, I mentioned builder pattern. It's, it's really just a Java way of uh, giving you some more flexibility and some, a nicer API. Um, yeah, I'm not going to linger on too much about it, but essentially you can validate things before they actually enter the class uh, that you want to instantiate. And uh, with that, you can actually, um, it, 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 it allows you to avoid a bunch of error handling stuff in, in, in the code itself. OK, on to more interesting things. Namely, um, how do people interact with the library when they're inside it? Um, good thing here is it's it's not rocket science, but we still have to think about what's what's the what's the cleanest possible uh, way to to design it. <coughs> I mean, usually my my, my go-to approach is is. Does it, does it adhere to solid principles, the stuff that uh, Uncle Bob's been talking about for ages? Uh, so single responsibility, interface segregation, and things like that. Is my thing, is my class doing just one thing? Is it doing it well? Yes, no. Um, is it easily testable? If things are following the solid principles, things are usually testable. And if things are testable, um, app, app developers who use your library are going to be really thankful. Or, actually no, if they're not testable, they're going to be pissed off. Um, and uh, you don't want to be, uh, be pissing off developers. Um, so yeah, key is don't surprise people. Don't don't try to invent something crazy for the sake of it. Just stick to the principles. Stick to the Swift way of doing it. Swift to the, stick to the Java way of doing it in in in, in their respective uh, platforms because that's what people are used used to, and they don't want to be spending too much time on on uh, integrating your your thing. But you can always go one step further and uh, do something really awesome. That's Border, borderline magical. Mm, a really cool thing, uh, well, really popular thing nowadays is uh, Rx, Rxifying everything. So um, we've had Rx Java for ages. We've had Rx Swift is actually becoming a thing now. Um, so essentially, Rx is a paradigm that allows you to transform events, well, transform, project asynchronous programming as a series of events that may be fired at any given time. And you then subscribe to those events, and most importantly, you can do operations on those events. Mm. There is a bunch of stuff in there, but if, if you're not familiar with it, you have a stream. It's called an observable, usually. And uh, you can then do things like you would do in any functional programming language. You can, you can say, if this condition is true, then I want to filter something. Um, I want to merge two different streams. And these streams can be like things like uh, um, from UI events to to IO events, so like network stuff, uh, databasey stuff. You can you can actually create those streams of observables from with anything. And uh, when something goes boom, it will always go in on error. So you always have one single way of handling your errors, which is cool as well. Um, yeah, you can you can do threading and uh, also all, all, all the cool stuff, but. It's awesome, but not everyone uses it. Um, 
And uh, if you have some asynchronous stuff, uh, my suggestion would be don't just rely on Rx unless your library is just an Rx library, in which case, yeah, <laughs> you don't want to be relying on callbacks. But if you're just doing something general for as many people as possible, stick to callbacks. And uh, you can always uh, provide an adapter, extra dependency that, that people can pull in to, to, to transform this asynchronous callback hell into an rx kind of stream. People are going to appreciate it. Yeah, Rx is just one example of uh, a domain-specific language. Uh, this is a interesting technique that uh, has been around for ages. Like people have been writing uh, C macros and uh, Lisp, ma Lisp macros uh, since I don't know uh, decades ago. Essentially, if a programming language doesn't do what you want it to do. Um, you may want to change the way it behaves in certain ways so that uh, you can you can make it uh, you can make it better for yourself uh, it's usually more suited for frameworks like on 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 the server side you got ruby on rails which is kind of dsl on top of ruby changes the language completely but kind of works really works really nicely allows you to do stuff really quickly but it has a different learning curve so it's 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 always a trade off of what you want to what you want to kind of achieve mm, techniques here um, macros usually and uh, annotations on Android especially. So uh, annotations allow you to write code that uh, writes other code. So um, you can generate classes, you can generate uh, methods based on using those uh, um, annotations. And uh, a cool thing with Swift and Kotlin is that you have also extension methods which, are, which allow you to create something that already exists, I don't know, a date class, and then add methods that would operate on that date class. And, uh, and yeah, that's also an example of a DSL because it kind of extends the core functionality of the language. And yeah, not everything happens. Uh, um, and not, not, not everything good happens all the time. So uh, we have to be ready. There is a distinction between handling errors in libraries and apps, because in apps we don't really want to want to handle things. Uh, we don't really want a user to know that something's crashed. We want to be as, as as gracefully failing as possible. On libraries, on your hand, the user is a developer. They want to know what happened because they want to debug it. They want to they want to understand it. They want to avoid those crashes in the future. So. Uh, as much let it crash as much as possible and let people know what's actually gone wrong because if they're if they're able to send you those crash reports if they're, they're able to 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 um, help you on your troubleshooting and uh, bug fixing that's always a good thing um, yeah a good, cool example of this is uh, you can actually add um, some extra spice to your error messages. For instance, like if, if you have a known thing that can happen with your library or a service um, and there is a known fix for it, you can actually just put that in your error messaging. People have started doing that already, so it's, it's, it's a really good sign because you control that URL. It's, it's your support URL. It's your uh, FAQ kind of thing. And, uh, and if you just point someone to that, they're less likely to just raise an actual uh, issue. Mm, yeah, we've done our design. Let's uh, talk about development now. Uh, most important with libraries is uh, we have to make sure that they perform to expectation and expectation is high. We don't want, like, because every dependency that you pull in as a developer is overhead. It's, uh, it really needs to solve our problem. It really needs to bring our value. And uh, the trade-off is usually, yeah, um, if something is making, is, is, has too big of a size, is, is, is too inefficient in its performance, then people are less likely to use it. So think about what factors affect your performance and uh, 
um, and just try and avoid as, as much bad things as possible. This may include writing uglier code in your implementation, which is fine, because as long as it works, then, uh, then people are going to be happy if the API is nice. So, uh, so something to keep in mind uh, here. Yeah, but on the, on the topic of making it work, how to do that, how to ensure it's working, you got to test it. Library testing is a bit different from app testing, uh, namely because you can't really easily instrument your, your app test, uh, library tests. You need, uh, you need a companion app that you instrument when it's using your library, so it's kind of it's kind of trickier approach to 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 testing than usual. Mm, unit testing that's usually quite easy. That's just testing code, methods, classes, how they how they work in, in isolation. But integration tests are probably going to be a bit harder. But yeah, if you have a companion app that you can you can verify its, its, its uh, interaction and its uh, functionality, then it's good. Another smart way of doing, doing testing and validation that something works is just actually using your product. So um, it's called dog fooding. It actually means make an app user that uses your library. You usually already do. So, uh, but if you don't, if the library is your product, then think about what kind of what kind of app you could build that you, that you could use to just see what works and what doesn't work. Another thing that you can't do in libraries is you can't track it because um, you can't really put Google Analytics in something that you don't control because it doesn't run in your apps. It doesn't run on on people. Um, well, if it ran on people's devices, developers would probably give you angry calls and uh, smear you on Twitter and whatever, and uh, they, they really wouldn't like it because why would my library be be uh, sending stuff um, about people's usage behind my back? I want to do that as a developer, but not other people. Unless you're obviously Fabric and Crashlytics, because that's their job essentially. For all other us, uh, all of other, uh, for for all everyone else, if we provide a service uh, that the library uses, so like um, at Pusher we can do that, for instance, because our libraries are hitting our APIs, we can actually put some extra headers and tracking information about the library version and maybe even system uh, system specific so that you can give the users uh, some insight of whether they're using something outdated or something similar. Uh, and again, if you have an app, you can put tracking in there and it's awesome. So uh, think about dog fooding again. Okay, so we've developed it. We need to ship it now. Um, few things here. Use semantic versioning. Very simple, very effective. Um, essentially, I mean, you've seen it pretty much everywhere nowadays, but I'm just going to illustrate it again. So you split the version in three parts, uh, major, minor, and patch. Mm, major implies I'm going to need to change my app because it's not going to even compile anymore if I update the library version. Um, minor means there have been some new changes, but it's usually just additions, and they're not going to change the the API itself. So that's that's you can quite safely update to that. And patch means yes, you should probably update because uh, because uh, we fixed some actual bugs. Um, there is a spec in there in sember.org. It's 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 a common thing. Now that we've versioned it, we have to release it, obviously. Um, things that you shouldn't do is uh, let people include your library in, in Git submodules. This is, in most cases, really bad idea, or all cases, in my, in my uh, experience. Um, it's, it's just bad UX, bad, uh, bad practice to, to ask people that. What you can do, however, is uh, you can uh, 
you can use existing frameworks and uh, package managers that will allow you to, to that people already use essentially. So CocoaPods is a big one, um, and Cartage is an up and coming one on, on Swift. Mm. On Android, you've got Maven Central, who's been around since forever, and uh, and uh, yeah, J Center is usually the default for Android projects nowadays. Um, Android is usually has it a bit easier because you've got the plugins and all that stuff to 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 do a lot of stuff for you. But uh, on iOS, it's it's quite scriptable. It all quite works. Um, but usually, well, if you're if you're if you're building something open source, that's fine. But if you're not doing some some open source stuff, then uh, you may want to release in a different fashion. So, Carthage and CocoaPods will work with private Git repos, uh, which is nice. Um, they're I think they're all. Yeah, they should be free. Yeah, I've used CocoaPods for free in a, in a private repo, definitely. Um, on uh, Android, you have the main ones, which are Sonatype and Artifactory. They're 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 quite pricey, but if you're an enterprise, you probably you maybe don't care. Um, but if you're if you're kind of just want to release something privately without costing you too much, then you can just uh, install the Artifactory as an open source server, and that's going to run for you as well. Yeah, so we released it. We just need to support now. So um, we support with docs, essentially. What I'm, what I'm talking about when I'm uh, talking about docs is um, I'm talking any anything that might be considered as documentation that would support people using your libraries. So uh, usually start with a quick start, which is quite mandatory, and. Uh, then you can have everything from just a bunch of lines in the README to elaborate wiki pages, um, and yeah, even tests can be a valid point of documentation. Because if you're if you're testing all of your features, then uh, you might wanna you might wanna um, you might bring some some extra value to people who are actually reading uh, those tests and, and understanding them. But most importantly, think about what makes sense for you and use that in your in your particular case. Want to put some extra attention on quick start. Essentially, it means stuff that I can copy paste in my app to 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 see my app library in action. And this is invaluable, like really priceless. I've seen people. Uh, Praise people's quick starts on, on, on social media and on and conference talks because they're just good and they just work and uh, that's a great way to increase your promotion in the end. So uh, if you can find a very simple snippet, what's the simplest thing to do to just two or three lines of code to, to get something up and running in my existing project, that's the way to do it. Um, if not, you've always got a sample code. Usually, when you're building a library, you're building the, the app to test it in anyway. So, um, small confined apps with clearly illustrated features of, of usage of features of the library. There may be several sample apps that use several different features of your library, but uh, essentially, um, they should illustrate what your library does. And maybe uh, the benefit is you can actually <coughs> go slightly deeper, um, point out things that uh, a quick start won't, won't show, and uh, things like uh, documentation, the method documentation references won't really show. Speaking of references, they're also uh, invaluable. They're free to make because you just add some comments to your code, and they're just going to be there. Um, and you run a script, and you end up with this uh, HTML or or uh, XML kind of documentation. What's even better is uh, you can actually package it as alongside your library, so that people who are using it will see it in their IDEs. And what's better than just quick suggestions for for uh, method names for, for 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 the reference implementation to see how how everything goes? Um, so this is like really invaluable. This is saves you a lot of time as a, as a support. Speaking of save, saving people's time, 
uh, documentation allows you to spend less time on support, spend less time helping people to use things, and uh, will just uh, make you happier and ha let you do more cool things. So yeah, essentially what we've gone through is uh, we've basically covered the basics of libraries in general and uh, then went through things from API design through development to releasing and all the way to support. And that's pretty much all I got and uh, is there any questions? Okay, thank you.